Good afternoon, and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and today is Wednesday, October 12th, 2005. We have a mercy court. And that's, uh, I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing enough. Oh, yes, there we go. And, uh, <laughs> a little distracting, but uh, this is October 12th, Wednesday, uh, 2005. And if you're listening today at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Pacific Daylight Time, this is a live broadcast for you. And you can participate in it. You can shape it. You can mold it. You can determine uh, exactly what is discussed on the program by the simple expedient of simply making a phone call. If you call a toll-free number that I'll be glad to give you in just a moment, uh, you can ask any question you have about Christianity or the Bible, about your own Christian life, or about Christian doctrine, or Christian ethics, or really anything related to that, even Christian history. Uh, I, may not, I may not know as much about some of the details of Christian history, but I know something about Christian history. I've lectured uh, for 45 hours on it before, so I may have some knowledge of, of what you're curious about. I may not. But uh, that's just the point. On live radio, the host doesn't have to know everything because listeners know stuff too. And if I don't know the answer, it's always possible that another listener may know and may be able to call in and uh, bring that up. So it's not uh, it's not all up, it's not entirely up to me to have the answers to everything. But I will endeavor to answer questions you have about the Bible if I can. And as I said, we can at least discuss them intelligently. And maybe if I don't know the answer, somebody else does. Which brings me to the next order of business, if you want to call. Uh, it may be that you have, in fact, heard an answer given by the host to a previous caller, and you disagreed with the answer, and you feel like there does need to be some correction or amplification or balance that was lacking, and you'd like to call and, and bring that. You can always call with an alternative viewpoint to that of the host, and you're welcome here no matter what your viewpoint is. You can, If you're not a Christian... If you're an atheist or a Hindu or a Buddhist or New Age or whatever, you know, you can always call if you have questions about Christianity or even objective, uh, objections to it. If there are things about Christianity you think are objectionable and you want to express that, I, uh, you're welcome here. Give me a call. I haven't given the number yet. Uh, our lines are starting to, to fill, but we still have some left, so give us a call at 1-800-438-5090. That's 1-800-438-5090 if you'd like to be on the program today. Again, you're listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and our first caller is also named Steve from Brownsville, Oregon. Steve, uh, well, let me see if I can get him on here. Push the right button instead of the wrong one. Hello, Steve. Welcome to the program. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. My question is... I better bring Steve's volume up somewhere in our studio. And I don't control that. Is that better now? Hello, control room. Ah, oh, I think I hear him. Hello, Steve. Hi. Hey, welcome to the program. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. I have a quick question. I'll take the rest of it off the air. Uh, okay. In regards to Matthew's account of the death of Jesus, and at the time of his death, the raising of the dead, um, that went into the city and proclaimed, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I looked up through a couple commentaries and so on and so forth, and they, they didn't have much of a treatment of it other than saying that it wasn't in the other Gospels and there was no other separate account. I'm curious if you have any opinions, uh, whether possibly it's symbolic or uh, a literal. Uh, it, to me, it comes across quite literal. I'm curious if you had any opinion on that. Yeah, okay, and you didn't. You prefer not to stay on the phone? Yeah, it would just be easier if I... <laughs> Hang up. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Steve, for your call. God bless you, too. All right. The passage you're talking about is in Matthew chapter 27, and it starts right around uh, verse, well, we'll start at verse 50, where Jesus actually uh, actually died. It says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Now, here's the passage specifically or the details that Steve was curious about. It says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, that's, that's all we have on this particular and, and peculiar uh, little detail. You're right that it doesn't have parallels in the other Gospels. 
It just says when uh, Jesus died, there was an earthquake, the rocks were split, graves were opened, and many bodies of saints, that would be holy, holy people, who had fallen asleep, that means who had died, were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, it doesn't say they preached, although they may have. It just says they came and appeared to many. Now, who were these people? Do, frankly, I take it literally. I don't see any reason not to. It doesn't look like it's, it's not appearing in a passage that is characterized by symbolism. It's, it's a historical narrative. I take the tearing of the veil from top to bottom as literal also. I suppose people could take it symbolically, but I, I, I guess I don't see any compelling reason to. Jesus did raise dead bodies when he was alive, and that he may have raised them in his death and resurrection is not impossible at all. Uh, Elisha raised a dead man after he himself had died. Uh, in Elisha, in Second Kings chapter 13, Elisha was buried in his, after he died. And after his body had decomposed, which, by the way, Jesus' body never did decompose, but Elisha did, and he was just bones. And uh, a dead, another dead body was thrown into the tomb of Elisha, and touched the bones of Elisha, and, and upon contact with those bones, that dead body came to life. Now, if Elisha could, in a sense, be instrumental in raising the dead, even after he was dead himself, I, how, how much more could Christ do the same thing in his death, and his resurrection, especially in view of the fact that Jesus raised dead people to life in his lifetime, Lazarus and Jairus' daughter and the son of a widow in the town of Nain, uh, Jesus raised these people from the dead, and I think that's essentially what happened here. Now, the identity of these people who came out of the graves is not known to us. It says saints, and the word saints is not used in the Bible <coughs> excuse me, in a specialized sense that uh, perhaps uh, we're accustomed to hearing it from the Roman Catholics, where a, a person who has died and was exceptional in their uh, holiness and, w and was canonized by the church is called a saint. In the New Testament, any godly person is called a saint. Every Christian is called a saint in the New Testament. So these are simply godly people who had died. Now, are these people who died centuries earlier, people like Abraham and David and Moses and people like that? I don't think so. Um, and my reason for not thinking so is, well, twofold. One is if, if men from these ancient centuries came back into Jerusalem at that time, no one would know who they were. And even if they were told, why would they believe them? You know, it seems to me that in order for this to be significant, it would have to be people who had died, but who had been known to the living and were seen alive again as sort of a sign of Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead, he never appeared to unbelievers, except for, uh, as near as we can tell, uh, James, his own brother, and uh, Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, as he was called then. Uh, for the most part, Jesus only appeared to those who were already his disciples before his death, after his resurrection. But there was apparently a witness given to the unbelievers in Jerusalem, just as there was when Lazarus was raised, uh, by these other people being raised. We don't know their identities, but that's not too surprising. Uh, throughout the Gospels, we read that Jesus went about and healed all sickness and cast out demons out of people. We don't, re we don't learn the names of all these people that he worked these miracles on. Uh, we don't even know the name of Jairus' daughter, whom he raised from the dead, or of, of the son of the widow of Nain. So the fact that we don't have the names or identities of these people is not really very significant, in my opinion. I think it's simply that some people had died, uh, who were known to be godly, and they were they had died recently. I mean, I don't know how recently, but but recently enough that living people still would recognize them, and would be impressed when they were seen living again. And this was a sign that I think God gave to the unbelievers in Jerusalem uh, without Jesus himself appearing to them, risen from the dead. Now, um, there's one other factor here that makes me think that these were people fairly recently dead. And I, I may be wrong about this, but I, I think that these must be people who had not yet decomposed. And that would mean they'd been, you know, killed. They died probably very recently. And my thought about that is that if they had been decomposed, then them coming out of the graves would be more than just the kind of miracle that Jesus wrought with Lazarus and Jairus' daughter. These were simply bodies that the Spirit had gone out of, and Jesus brought the Spirit back into the bodies. If these bodies had gone to the dust, he would have to reconstitute the whole body as well as bring the Spirit into it, which I believe he could do. But that kind of a raising from the dead 
is the kind that I think awaits the end of the age, when all that are asleep in the grave and all who've gone to the dust will be raised from the dead, and their bodies will be reestablished, re reconstituted by, by God. And that kind of resurrection, I think, has never happened. Uh, and I don't think it happened then. Paul said, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, and after that, those who are his, at his coming. So this kind of resurrection, the kind of resurrection that involves a, a, a glorious body being created, as opposed to just putting breath back into the, the old dead body, the kind that, that really means that the, the body is raised in immortality, has never happened yet. It happened to Christ, the first fruits, and Paul said after that, the next in order, will be us, that is coming. So when he comes, which has not yet happened, then we will experience that. But I don't think the Bible allows that there has been any of that kind of resurrection with any people between the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection that remains to be realized in the end time. So I think that these people were simply uh, reanimated. Their breath was brought back into their bodies, which had not yet gone very far into uh, decomposition. I can be wrong, but that's how I reason about it. And as far as uh, its significance, as I said, it seems to be a sign that God gave to the inhabitants of Jerusalem on the occasion of Jesus rising from the dead without Jesus himself appearing to them. Now, why Jesus didn't choose to appear to them, I don't know. But he did appear to his disciples. It's possible that he did not want to cast his pearls before swine. And certainly to see Jesus raised from the dead is uh, would be a great pearl, uh, would be one of the greatest sacred privileges anyone could have, and he reserved that privilege, apparently, for his disciples. All right, so that, that's actually a very good question. A lot of people have it. And when you read through the Gospel of Matthew, those two verses kind of tweak you. They kind of stick out as weird, and uh, I don't know if my explanation is the correct one, but I, I give you the explanation that I've always kind of felt about that to be the case. There may be people with more insights, and maybe they'll call us. The number to call, and our, as our lines are open right now, is 1-800-438-5090. That's 1-800-438-5090. There's a question that's been written in. This has to do with healing. It says, since Jesus received 39 lashes in order to acquire our healing, should Christians ever accept sickness as the will of God for them? Now, Okay, this starts with the assumption that Jesus received 39 lashes to, to purchase our healing. We know that Jesus did receive 39 lashes, but we don't know that that was to acquire our healing. The reason that people sometimes say that, and in fact it's very commonly said uh, that that is so, is that they understand some verses in Isaiah 53 to be saying that. Now, I understand those same verses a little differently. It says in Isaiah 53, in verses uh, 5 and 6, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Actually, it's a, that's verse 5. The previous verse, verse 4, says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. This expression, borne our griefs, could be translated, borne our sicknesses. And carried our sorrows could be translated, he's carried our pains. In fact, that's how, how it's rendered when this verse, uh, Isaiah 53, 4, is quoted in Matthew 18, er, Matthew 8, 17. But the, the business about the 39 lashes or the stripes that Jesus received somehow accomplishing healing <coughs> of diseases is based on the way some people understand Isaiah 53, 5. He was, uh, it says, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, if this is true, that Jesus receive these stripes in order to purchase our healing from physical sicknesses, then it would follow that it's no more appropriate for Christians to accept a condition of sickness for themselves, which Jesus has purchased the healing from, than it would be appropriate for Christians to accept a condition of being unforgiven for their sins, since Jesus purchased the forgiveness of our sins with his death. If he purchased forgiveness and healing, then it should be inappropriate for Christians to settle for anything less than forgiveness and healing, since those were purchased on their behalf by Christ. 
And that's how many people understand it. This is the way, the, uh, for, for one thing, the Word of Faith people understand it, but also some who would not call themselves Word of Faith but are nonetheless uh, keen on, on healing ministry. They often will say that, you know, with his stripes we're healed and therefore we shouldn't be sick. Well, if that is the meaning of Isaiah 53, uh, 5, then I have to agree with that reasoning because I certainly believe that Jesus purchased our forgiveness of our sins at the cross, and it is absolutely unnecessary and inappropriate for Christians to, to uh, you know, to, to, uh, to settle for not being forgiven. But what about sickness? I, I personally don't believe that Isaiah 53, 5 is talking about physical healing of physical sicknesses. Now, that's not because I don't believe in healing. I do. In fact, I, I have reason to believe I was healed of a very serious illness when I was young. And I, I do believe that God heals, including miraculously. Uh, so I'm not saying what I'm saying about Isaiah 53 in order to discount uh, anyone's belief in healing, because I believe in healing. But what I'm saying is that this verse is not talking about that kind of healing. And the reason I say that is because in Isaiah, which is where this verse appears, there has been from chapter 1 on a motif that the prophet recurrently comes to where the nation of Israel is sick and in need of a physician, sick and in need of a healing. Now, the sickness of the nation is metaphorical in Isaiah. You find in Isaiah chapter 1 that the nation of Israel is said to be like a, a man who's been bruised from head to toe. His, his wounds are oozing and, and they're infected and no one has healed him. No one has bound up his wounds. No one has treated his sickness. And that is a, a metaphor for the condition of the nation of Israel under the judgment of God. Because God says he had smitten them, and they had received no correction. And they were now beaten black and blue, and no one's helping them because they're, they're under the curse of God. They're, they're basically under God's judgment, and they're not repenting. Well, throughout the, the, the book of Isaiah, you find again and again this reference to the sickness of the nation and their need for a healer. And it's all metaphorical. It's not talking about people who are sick. It's talking about a nation that is sick and bruised and wounded because they've taken a lot of chastisement from God and they've not repented and they're therefore under the wrath of God. That's their sick condition. But it says of Jesus, with his stripes we are healed, meaning that his punishment that he received has healed this condition that Isaiah has been talking about throughout the whole book, namely this condition of being under God's wrath. This We are no longer under God's wrath because of what Jesus endured. And you can see that, too, if you look carefully at Isaiah 53, 5, and objectively and intelligently, because you, you'll, you'll see that all of this whole chapter and, and the chapters before and after it are written in poetry. Um, most of the prophetic books are written in poetry, and Hebrew poetry has a feature that's very identifiable, just as you can tell most English poetry by the feature of rhyme and meter and so forth. You can always recognize Hebrew poetry by the element of parallelism. That is, the same thing is said twice in different ways. That's something that to the Hebrew ear was considered to be aesthetically pleasing. And poetry and songs, like the Psalms do this all the time, and the Proverbs, all the poetic books of the Bible, you find this repetition, this, this parallelism. And here in Isaiah 53, 5, if you check it out, you'll see the same parallelism. It's in poetry. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Now, those two, those two lines mean exactly the same thing. He was wounded and he was bruised. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Iniquities and transgressions are parallel ideas. Bruised and wounded are parallel ideas. Then the next two lines also are parallel to each other. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, chastisement refers to taking a beating. And so, the chastisement in the third line of the verse is parallel to the stripes in the fourth line, receiving stripes. That's chastisement. Now, the chastisement was for our peace, it says. Well, our peace has to do with our relationship with God. It has to do with our reconciliation. It has to do with God ceasing to be angry at us for our sins has to do with God reconciling us to himself. That chastisement Jesus received was for our peace, and the parallel to that is with his stripes, that is with the same chastisement, we are healed. That is, the healing is parallel to peace with God. 
it's not parallel to anything else in the whole book of Isaiah that speaks of physical sickness literally being healed. So I do believe, of course, in physical healing. I want to make that clear. I'm just saying this verse isn't talking about that. And one way we know it isn't talking about that is because it's quoted in the New Testament. And it's quoted by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. And Peter quotes it in an entirely different way than if he was applying it to physical healing. Peter quotes it in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, speaking of Christ in verses 24 and 25. He says, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now it's interesting, he says, by whose stripes you were healed. And by way of explanation of that comment, he says, because you were like sheep going astray. You were alienated from God. But you've been restored. You've been reconciled to God. You've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It's clear that the healing that Peter is referring to that has happened to the Christian already is the healing of his relationship with God. Just like Isaiah was talking about. Our peace. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. That is our relationship with God is healed. The metaphorical sickness of, of the nation of Israel throughout the book of Isaiah is healed. That metaphorical sickness was alienation from God and the wrath of God upon them. The healing is reconciliation and peace with God. That's what Jesus accomplished. Isaiah is not talking about physical healing. And if he was, Peter missed it entirely. Peter didn't see it that way. What's more, why should Peter see it that way? Peter knew the Old Testament. We don't, most of us. Most of us don't read it very well. We just have our proof text for favorite doctrines. But if you read through the Old Testament, you'll find the idea of healing is frequently associated with healing people's backslidings. In Jeremiah's book, it says it many times. God says, I will heal your backslidings. In Hosea also, Hosea's prophecy says God will heal their backslidings. Now, backslidings is going the wrong way, away from God. But if God heals their backsliding, then he brings them back the right way. And Peter says, his, by his stripes you've been healed because you were like sheep going astray, because you were backsliding. And he's healed your backsliding. He's returned you to himself. So, uh, you know, it, it, to me, I think it's entirely a misunderstanding of Isaiah 53, 5, to make that a statement about Jesus purchasing healing. Now, I told you I do believe in healing. But I believe in that healing is offered to us not on the basis of purchase, but on the basis of, of God's raw power offered mercifully to those that he chooses to heal. Now, it's different than forgiveness of sins, because God must forgive the sins of everyone who repents in the name of Christ. Now, it's not me that's putting that on God. Jesus puts it on him. God puts it on himself. It says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Just means he, 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 it's a matter of justice with him to forgive our sins. Why? Does he owe it to us? No, but he owes it to Christ. Christ paid the price for our sins. And were God not to forgive us in Christ's name, then Jesus paid the price for nothing. And God owes it to his own son to forgive the sins of those for whom he died. So God's forgiveness of our sins is a matter of his justice because of the atonement. But his healing us is not a matter of his justice. It's never been, it's not been purchased for us. And therefore, when Paul in Philippians chapter 2 talks about his friend Epaphras who had been sick, it says that God had mercy on him, means he healed him. It was mercy, not justice, that healed him, because it wasn't owed. When God heals a person, it's not owed. It would be if it was purchased for us, just like our forgiveness is owed because it's purchased for us. But healing is, a diff is different, because the Bible does not say anywhere that Jesus actually purchased our healing. And, it's, and the doctrine comes almost entirely from a particular interpretation of Isaiah 53, 5, which, as I said, does not seem to be the most, uh, the most re responsible way to look at that verse. Uh, however, I do believe in praying for the sick. I do believe that God heals. I just don't believe that he owes it to anyone to heal them. I don't think he heals in every case. He heals when it is his will to heal, and that's the only time that I'd wish to be healed, is if it was his will. Let's talk next to uh, Frank. We've had our lines full for a while here. I need to start talking to some of these people here. Frank from uh, Albany, Oregon. Frank, welcome to the program. Hi, Steve. I have a question about, well, pretty much the other aspect of what you were just covering, um, the forgiveness of sin. I know that, like, in Hebrews it says the blood of bulls and goats and et cetera couldn't take away sin. 
But the question I have is, in the Old Testament, um, I know David said sacrifice and offering you did not require. But there's another part where Nathan speaks to David and says to him, the Lord has, I think he said, like, put away your sin or something like that. You will not yeah. die. Yeah. So my main question, because I want to have be able to answer people from, like, a Jewish background that would have a question on this, is what really is the difference between what Jesus did and what the Old Testament did as far as sin? Okay. Well, David, David, oh, okay. Thanks for calling, Frank. All right. Now, you mentioned that Nathan said to David that he will not die for his sin, and that's true. But Paul brings that very instance up in Romans chapter 4 and points out that this uh, justification that came to David was not uh, accomplished through the law or through works. Uh, David did not offer an animal sacrifice to cover that sin. It says in Psalm 51, which David wrote when he was repenting for that very sin, he said, you know, if you had desired sacrifice, I, I would offer it to you, but you don't. That, the sacrifices you want are a broken and contrite spirit. So David did not actually acquire forgiveness through offering animal sacrifices at all or doing anything. He, he was forgiven because he repented, and God announced, okay, I forgive you for that. Now, what Paul points out in Romans chapter 4 is that David knew, as Abraham had before him, the, the blessedness of one whose sins are forgiven apart from the works of the law. Now, uh, so, so the fact that people could be forgiven of their sins in the Old Testament is clear, but it wasn't through the sacrifices. Abraham also, uh, he believed God, and, it, and that was imputed to him for righteousness, it says in Genesis 15, 6. And, of course, Abraham did offer animal sacrifices, but that it was not on those occasions that it says he was justified. It was his faith that was imputed for righteousness. Now, I believe this that the Old Testament sacrifices never took away sin. I, I, I glean that from the writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews argues it this way, that they offered these sacrifices year by year, and they had to keep doing it. And it must mean because they never really did the job. Why would they have to keep repeating it? Jesus only had to die one time <clears throat> to do the whole job once and for all, but the animal sacrifices had to be repeated every year and every day. And for that reason, it's clear that those animal sacrifices and the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. They could kind of uh, temporarily cover over it, uh, obscure it, hide it, but they could not take it away. Only the blood of Christ could do that, and that's why Jesus had to come and die. Now, I believe that the Old Testament sacrifices were all essentially symbolic depictions in advance of what God was going to ultimately do through Christ. Christ was going to come and be the Lamb of God who would be slain and would take away the sins of the world. For the 1400 years or 1500 years before Jesus came, God instructed the Jews to offer these animal sacrifices, which were a ritual symbolically anticipating the sacrifice of Christ. They looked forward to it. And this was, I think, to condition the people of Israel for an important lesson they were going to have to learn. And that was that every time they laid their hand on a bull or a lamb or a goat and then killed it, that laying of, of the hand on the, and the animal signified symbolically that they were transferring their sins to the animal. Now, the, sin, the animal was innocent, but the, the sinner who needed forgiveness of sins was allowed to do a, a ritual that symbolized that his sins were being transferred to an animal and the animal was killed instead of him. So it was to cement in their minds the concept that you cannot pay for your sins, you have to have them transferred to an innocent victim who will then have to die for you. And that, of course, was anticipating the fact that Christ, who did no sin, would become sin for us, that our sins would be laid upon him, that he would carry our sins on the cross, and he would die in our place, and he'd be the Lamb of God. So all those sacrifices were there to communicate and indoctrinate the Jews in that concept which they needed to understand when the Messiah would come. Well, Jesus came, and some of the Jews did understand it. The, the ones who became disciples, the ones who didn't understand it, remained unconverted. But uh, I believe that God was able to forgive in the Old Testament, not because the Jews offered animal sacrifices, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that's not what did it, but because of the sacrifice of Christ, which had not yet been made, but which was anticipated. Uh, Paul says something like that in Romans chapter 3, and I think this is sort of answering the question of how God managed to forgive people in the Old Testament before Jesus came. It says, um, 
let me see where I want to start reading here. It says in verse 21 of Romans 3, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom, this is verse 25, this is the main verse I wanted to bring out, uh, or at least the next few, uh, probably 25 and 26, whom, Christ, God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, that is, Christ offered his blood as a sacrifice of atonement, through faith to demonstrate God's righteousness, because in his forbearance, that means in God's tolerance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now, that's, that's an important verse. That's Romans 3.25. God set forth Christ to propitiate for the sins of mankind. And this, in a sense, showed that God was just even in the times before when he, when he passed over sins that were previously committed before Jesus came, like the sins of David and Abraham and those who were justified in the Old Testament. God, knowing that he was going to send Christ, and ultimately did send Christ, justified all the acts of forgiveness he had, in his forbearance, done before this time. And one way that it's been said, I think is quite correct, is that God forgave people in the Old Testament on credit. But if Jesus had not come and died to pay that tab, they could never really ultimately realize their forgiveness. Uh, Christ had not yet come, but he was going to. And so God would forgive those who had faith and realize that ultimately Christ would come and pay the tab on that, and which he has done. Frank, I hope that helps. We've got other callers we're going to have to go to right now, but I hope that clears up a difficult uh, matter. Let's talk to Richard, who's calling from Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, Richard, welcome to the program. Thanks, Steve. I think my question will be pretty quick and easy, but... Uh I read New King James uh, Version, and uh, in in the Old King James Version, there's, like, no difference in the typeset. But in my New King James, when they're entering what I consider poetic language, the typeset is different. You know what I mean? The paragraph form is different. Right. Par- yeah, exactly. They, they, they indent it differently. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how is that determination made by the translators? That's a, that's a good question. I think usually uh, in the Greek and in the Hebrew of the original, scholars in those languages can recognize when a passage is written in poetry, just like you and I could recognize English poetry. Uh, and all modern translations, as, as far as I know, King James is the only one that doesn't do this, all modern translations do take those passages which are in poetry in the original, and they set them in verse form rather than in... Uh, paragraph form, or they, they just have a different kind of paragraph indention to show that this is poetry. Um, and they, how do they notice that? I think they know it just by the features of Hebrew poetry. And, well, and I know there's an acrostic. Yeah, yeah well, one, one feature of Hebrew poetry is, is acrostic, though not, not all Hebrew poetry follows an acrostic right. pattern, but, but lots of the Psalms do, and some of the, uh, like chapter, uh, chapter 31 of the Proverbs, uh, from verse 10, in Lamentations, right, has a cross, that's right. And, uh, you know, an acrostic, for those who don't know, is, is a poem in, in the Hebrew, uh, that goes through the Hebrew alphabet, and each verse of the poem starts with the successive letter of the alphabet, or maybe two or three verses begin with one verse, and then the next two or three with the next, uh, letter of the alphabet, and the next two or three with the next, and, but they go through the whole alphabet. And there's, uh, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and you can usually tell an acrostic poem in the Psalms, or Lamentations is another acrostic, and, and there are others in the Scripture. You can usually tell them because the number of verses is either 22 or 44 or 66 verses yeah. in the chapter. And you can tell that that's uh, probably, it, since it's divisible by 22, it's probably one of the acrostics that, that follows either uh, you know one or two or three verses on each letter of the alphabet going through. But that's only, you can't always use that because the majority of the poetry uh, in the Bible is not acrostic. It's just a, an unusual feature when it is, and it is a poetic feature. But the main feature of poetry in the Bible, as I said, is parallelism. Okay. And that's, that's where it's very clear. When, 
when uh, two lines say essentially the same, two successive lines say the same thing in different words. And sometimes when the poet is really going, uh, you know, waxing eloquent, he'll have three or four lines saying exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's for emphasis, and I'm sure it's for aesthetic purposes that they did that. The, the reason I ask is because I'm, uh, I'm in the major prophets now in my reading, and I notice that sometimes when they're saying, you know, thus saith the, thus saith the Lord, or the word of the Lord came upon me, sometimes it is in paragraph form, and sometimes it's in the, uh, the poetic form. And yeah, well, the majority of the time it's in poetic form. Yeah. In, in the major prophets, in the major prophets, there's some narrative sections that that are in the normal paragraph form right and but but most of their oracles are poetic and it might be a few exceptions but uh, as I said I think the I think the uh, scholars can just tell from this from the style of the Hebrew mm-hmm. you know that this this is a, a poetic section here okay all right that's helpful Steve thank yeah. you yeah you know I'm not sure but it might even be different in the manuscripts you know, I'm not sure if the if the Hebrew manuscripts have laid it out differently. Probably not. Well, but, I mean, uh, just what what you said. You know, if I'm if I'm reading a a book and there's a bit of poetry inserted in the book, you know, in English, it's not hard for me to recognize. When I know. I'm breaking away from a, a descriptive text. Even yeah, even if they don't, um, even if they don't set it up in in lines like poetry. Mm-hmm. If if you read three or four verses, uh, three or four sentences in a in a prosaic text, and they all end with rhyming words to each other and have the same number of beats, you think, yeah. well, I think they should have set this up in poetic form rather than this, because this is obviously That's intentional. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay, Richard. All right. Bless you, Steve. God bless you. Bye bye now. Bye. All right, we're going to talk next to Michael calling from Watsonville, California. And if you'd like to be on the program, we have lines open at one eight hundred. Four three eight five zero nine zero. My name is Steve Gregg. You're listening to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. And Michael, uh, it's good to hear from you again. I'm trying to activate your button here. There we go. We got you. Hello, Michael. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hello. Hi, Steve. Um, good to hear from you again. What's that? Good to hear from you again. Although your your vo- your voice is kind of tinny. Where are you today? Oh, I'm at a different pace phone. I'm actually in Santa Cruz. Oh, okay. Usually you call from the airport out in yeah, Washington, I think. Yeah, uh, um, I'll, I'll speak as hard as I can. Anyway, um, just following right in line with, with some of your earlier callers today, I wanted to, to get a clarification of what I'm hearing at as the, the dual natures. Uh, there, there seems to be the, the what I could call the sanctified nature or, or the, the, the divine nature and then the sin nature. And, and I'm wondering, like, let, let's say that the the divine nature was, was like water, and the sin nature is, is like oil. And and so I'm wondering, in this process of forgiveness or or, or, or grace or sanctification, is that, is that basically making one thing in, into something completely different? How how is it to be understood? The, the, the whole, the, 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 the transformation that occurred, that is said to occur by grace in the Christian view. All right. Well, uh, the, the process of eliminating sin from the life of the believer is called sanctification. And uh, actually, there are four or five different views of how sanctification occurs uh, held among Christian people. And so whatever I say will disagree with what some other people think the Bible teaches on this. My understanding is as follows, that when God made mankind originally before the fall, he gave them, you know, the divine nature. They were made in his image. And we don't know very much about that aspect because they fell so quickly. None of us have ever met a person who's unfallen. I mean, only only Jesus would be an exception. and most We've never seen him with our eyes. So... We, we, what we see around us all the time are ordinary human beings who are a mixture of the divine nature that's still in mankind, but also the, the flaw of sin that has entered into our nature. And that flaw is, uh, well, I think most Christian theologians would say it's, it's not like oil sitting on top of water. It's more like shot through. It's more like the lemon and the sugar in lemonade. You know, it's all mixed up together. Is, and, uh, is it understood as intrinsic? 
or, 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 or whatever the opposite of, uh, like, superficial. Is it, yeah. is it in the nature of the thing, or, or, or is it, uh, um, like, added on, or, 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 or something very deeply mixed in to the nature, but not, not identical to, to the nature? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that that goes a little deeper than I've ever gone. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. And if I did give an answer, it might not represent, you know, mainstream Christian theology about that because I'm I don't fully understand it. I, I my guess is you'd find different people have different answers to that because the Bible doesn't address that question directly. What the Bible does direct is that man is by nature uh, selfish and rebellious against God. And we, the, the name that is given for that nature, for that selfishness of nature, is called sin. Now, you know, we're, we're trying to find phys- examples from the physical realm, like, you know, oil and water or, you know, f- liquid substances mixed together. And, you know, those, those are for illustrative purposes only. They may not be very, they may not be very uh, you know, accurate. Um, all, all we can say for sure is that the human nature still has something of God's image, still has a craving for God, for connectedness to God, still has it deep down inside an awareness of what justice should be and and a sense of, uh, you know, sort of a divine uh, viewpoint. But it's been very much corrupted, been very much corrupted by the choice to, to live selfishly. I guess that could be called conscience, although we've talked about that before, Conscience can be conditioned by society. Right. So you, you would not see those as, as equal necessarily. Right. But so some, some type of sense of uh, of being accountable to something greater than one's own interest. Uh huh. Now, now, see, one of the problems uh, I have with this kind of discussion is that I'm I don't I'm not given to a lot of mystical kind of <laughs> uh, thinking or abstract thinking of, of that particular kind. Um, I think more in concrete categories, you know. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't abstractions that lie behind these concrete categories. It's just that I don't know that I have all the inf- I don't know if the Bible tell us, tells us all the abstract things. Uh, and so we'd, we'd be left to speculate about some of them. What is concrete is that we belong uh, originally to a garden, that we belong to God, and that we have uh, basically run away from our Father. And that running away and the life that we have lived separated from him is called sin. It's, it's selfish. It's, uh, it victimizes other people to a certain extent. It certainly victimizes God because he's not getting what he deserves from us. And we need to be forgiven for having done so, and we need to go back and be with God again. So there's two parts to this. One is that, I mean, it, it, it'd be one thing if the prodigal son came home and said, okay, Dad, I'm home Please let me come home and live with you again. Uh, now, he has returned to his father, but if his father said, no way, I'm so offended by you, I just don't want to ever see your face again, you know. I mean, what that, what that boy needed first was forgiveness. His father had to show mercy and compassion and forgiveness to him first, but after that, the boy had to live in a reconciled relationship with his father, uh, which he had been rebelling against previously. So there's two aspects to what Christianity uh, says needs to be done. We need to be forgiven for our rebellion against God and for our sins so that God receives us. And the second thing is we need to live with him. We need to uh, live in obedience to him and we need to uh, basically stop stop living in sin. Now, how that's accomplished, you and I have discussed this before, and, and you come from uh, a, 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 the perspective of, of a different religion than Christianity, but uh, you, what what I've tried to emphasize is that other religions sometimes are able to imbue their their worshipers with a, a higher quality of virtue than than they had before. I mean, or at least apparently. Now, we don't know what's going on in the hearts of other people, but, we, but in terms of external behavior, some people who are not Christian, by embracing another religion than Christianity, will, will live a, a, a moral life, uh, a compassionate life. Uh, a clean life, you know, and but that doesn't make them the same as Christianity, even if Christians and let us say Christians and Buddhists lived exactly the same kind of lives in terms of their morality. You, you, from, your, from the point of view of Christianity, the, the um, 
the, the, the gap or the, or the, 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 the reconciliation has not occurred. It, right, exactly. Uh-huh. Exactly. It's, it's like, if, you know, if, if you as a Buddhist would say to God, okay, God, I'm coming back to, to live a moral life the way I always should have and the way that you want people to live, you'd still have the issue of receiving forgiveness for, for past rebellion or past offenses against him. Now, of course, the Bible teaches that God will gladly grant that forgiveness to anyone who comes uh, pleading the merits of Christ. But if somebody comes pleading their own merits and says, well, you know, God, I'm, I'm going to live a better life now, and I really think you should just kind of overlook all that bad stuff I did, and I'm going to be pretty good, and I'm going to pay my own price here, my own debt, God, uh, in, in some ways, I think that that's offensive to God, because it suggests that our sins against him were not as as uh, egregious in our thinking well, as they are in his. Also, it, it, would, it would not take into account that, that the only, from, from, from the Christian point of view, the, the only possible way of, of true virtue or, or, or true, true uh, um, finding harmony in the universe is the relationship to, to, to the Creator. That, that, well, that's true. Apart from that, from a Christian point of view, it, it, would, it would be a, a sort of synthesized virtue or, or just something different from, from that actual living relationship with, with God. Yeah, yeah. If it, was, if it was not through Christ, the Christian belief is that those who live a, a, a seemingly a righteous life through other religions, their virtue is like a man-made virtue. They've made it by their own you know, their own grit, their own willpower, uh, their own self-discipline. Now, Christians also need to have grit and willpower and self-discipline, but according to what we understand the Bible to teach, we can't really live inwardly and outwardly pleasing to God unless God himself does a work within us. It says in, in Philippians chapter 2, I think it's verse 13, that it says God, it's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So in the Christian, God has come to dwell inside through his Holy Spirit and is working in the believer to to cause that person to will and do what God wants. And, uh, you, you know, I think human beings without God can sometimes want to do what's right and can even do what's right to a large extent. But they don't do so in the sense of uh, honoring God, or they're not doing it in a sense of humility and submission to God and trusting in Him to uh, allow them or to enable them. They're doing it with a sense that they can do this, I can do this, you know, I can pull this off. And I think that that attitude in Scripture is treated as if it's uh, an, a sort of an arrogance that God uh, finds distasteful. Well, just very quickly, this will be my final point: is shifting gears and going back to my Jewish heritage. In fact, today happens to be Yom Kippur, yes. the Day of Atonement, and so that would imply that, that God has set aside a certain time to repent, to, to, to try and make amends. I'm, I've spent a long time since Hebrew school, but I remember the basic theme being something like that. So, so that, that, that whole uh, paradigm, would, would, that, would that be rendered unnecessary? Uh, from a Christian point of view, because it was the New Covenant. You mean the observance of uh, Yom Kippur? And, and, and the, yeah, and, and, and the, 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 any type of particular ritual or, or, or uh, uh, gesture of repentance, so, which I'm, I'm sure the Yom Kippur was not the only one. I'm sure there was right, one. okay. Well, as far as gestures of repentance, I, I think there needs to be true repentance. That certainly is never made obsolete. As far as whether there's a need for rituals uh, that are gestures of repentance, I, I guess it would depend on which um, stream of Christianity you talk to. You know, the, uh, there are uh, the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox and, and, and some Protestant groups have their rituals that they've adopted. Uh, in my opinion, most of them are man-made. They're not, they're not found in the Bible, and therefore they're not essential to Christianity, but they, I guess, have found them helpful. You know, like penance and things like that that are found in the Roman Catholic Church. You know, uh, I I don't see any need for the ritual of penance, uh, but at the same time, that's basically what young Kippur is. It's, a, it's very much along that line. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know the modern modern Jews will fast uh, on young Kippur, right. 
And, of course, back in Leviticus 16, where God was uh, establishing the ritual for Yom Kippur, he, uh, he also said they had to fast on that day. But there also were blood sacrifices that had to be offered by the high priest in the Holy of Holies. And that's what the modern Jew doesn't have. The, the modern Jew does not have a temple, does not have a high priest, and does not have blood sacrifices. And, and God said in Leviticus chapter 17 that it is the blood that he gave to be the atonement. And so on the Day of Atonement, they really need the blood sacrifices. But, the, of course, they can't do that now because the temple is gone. The temple is destroyed in 70 A.D. Now, the Christian belief is that God would never have allowed the temple to be destroyed and the, and, and the cessation of the ritual of Yom Kippur if God had not, in the meantime, provided some alternative for his people. And, of course, we believe that Jesus, who died before the temple was destroyed, was the alternative that God provided, and therefore he rendered Yom Kippur and, and the other temple rituals uh, obsolete because he, he brings forgiveness of our sins by his blood and by our simply uh, believing in him. So it's a very different thing than, than you know, being atoned because we have a ritual of, of repentance, but there certainly needs to be repentance before God yeah. uh, in the heart. Yeah. Well, that's something for me to contemplate today. Well, Michael, I, you know, I'm going to be at the at Mike and Brenda's again this Friday night. Maybe I'll see you there. Yeah, yeah, and I hope I can be there as well. Thanks, thanks you very much, Steve. I always enjoy conversing with you. God bless you, Michael. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg. We're here Monday through Friday doing this very same thing, just taking phone calls from anybody who has questions about Christianity. Uh, Michael, who just called, uh, calls from time to time. He's... Uh, Jewish by birth, Buddhist by religious conviction, and uh, and a friend uh, of this ministry actually, and that he calls frequently and comes to our meetings. and And we, I'd just like to say, you know, to anyone else out there who's not a Christian, if you are looking for dialogue, uh, if you're if you're hungry to know why Christianity appeals or commends itself to so many people, uh, we'd be glad to talk to you about that. If you have uh, rejected Christianity in favor of a, uh, a different religion and you'd like to tell me what it was about Christianity that you objected to and that made you go the direction you went, you're welcome to uh, call about that. Not today. We're out of time today, but uh, we're on tomorrow, the next day, every day. I hope you'll become a regular listener if you are not already. And anytime you have questions, that you'll feel free to call in, regardless of where you're standing uh, in your own beliefs. I, uh, I enjoy talking to people like, like Michael. Well, I mentioned to him that this Friday night I'll be speaking in Santa Cruz in a home. That home is, uh, in, uh, well, it's a home we've met in a number of times with people who listen here, and uh, you're welcome to come if you live in the Santa Cruz area. It's this Friday night at 7 o'clock. If you'd like directions to the home, you'll have to phone for directions. You'll call Mike or Brenda at this number. It's uh, 831 area code. That's 475 8301. That's 475-8301. Uh, you can find that number at our website, and I really want you to know that website is there with a lot of resources for you. Uh, we're one of the one of the ministries, one of the few that I know that doesn't sell anything. Uh, everything at our website is free. We've got several hundred MP3 files, uh, biblical teachings there. We've got printed uh, resources. We've got a Bible form, which is electronic forum for posting questions and getting answers. The website's just loaded with resources for you and everything's free. So uh, just go there. It's www.thenarrowpath.com The ministry is supported by donations from those who choose to help us out. The address to write to is The Narrow Path P.O. Box 3633 Santa Cruz, California that's 3633 Santa Cruz, California, 95063. Till tomorrow, this is Steve Gregg. Thanks for joining us. Tune in again tomorrow, and we will continue this discussion.